Welcome to the 2017 AMATIC webinar series. Today, we have got MINTS, Math Interactive Notebook Teaching Strategies with Christina Leone and Silvia San Pedro. This presentation is sponsored by the Innovative Teaching and Learning Committee. Please note that the views expressed by the presenter are not necessarily the views of AMATIC. Commercial products mentioned by the presenters are not endorsed by AMATIC. McGraw-Hill is our sponsor for the webinar series this year. Thank you very much, McGraw-Hill. Uh, biographies, I'd like to do just a short introduction before they take over. And um, I'm going to change this because my face is in the, in the words. <laughs> Christina Leone teaches transitional mathematics and statistics at Lone Star College Fairbanks Center. She graduated from the University of Houston with a BS in mathematics as well as a master's in mathematics education. Christina enjoys the outdoors with her husband and loves her dog Pearl with all her heart. Sylvia has taught the um, transitional mathematics courses and currently teaches credit level courses at Lone Star College Fairbanks Center. She graduated from the University of Houston with a BS in mathematics and has earned two master's degrees, one from St. Thomas University in mathematics education, as well as a master of science in, in mathematics from Texas A&M. Sylvia is married, has two children, and enjoys traveling and crocheting. I am going to, without further ado, turn it over to uh, Christina and Sylvia at this point. Take it away. Well, thanks for the introduction. Uh, we wanted to welcome you guys to Mints. Uh, if you have your booklet out and all your supplies, I guess we're ready to get started. <laughs> it's not advancing. Try clicking on your screen and then hit the, oh, there, there you go. go. All right. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> well, we did the introductions already. Um, what I want to talk about is more about the rationale behind creating the notebook. Uh, and that is uh, we realized that students were, didn't have disorganized notebooks, notes were not taken correctly or incomplete. Um, they were not using their notebooks uh, or their notes to study or to refer back to when they were doing homework. So we wanted to get something that was a little bit more, or quite a bit, yeah. more okay. organized for them. Okay. So uh, the Math Interactive Notebook is, again, a highly organized notebook for students. Um, it, it seems a little tedious at first, but the students really uh, get used to it and they really appreciate it. We're going to make a miniature version in this webinar just so you can have the notes and kind of see what it might look like. We do have pictures of our actual notebook throughout the PowerPoint so you can see some glimpses of it. Um, and just another mention, if you have any questions, we are going to watch our time and kind of move along as we can. So any questions you have, you can put in the Q&A tab and we can email you back or we can uh, meet at a different time if you need some more specific. All right, so the initial notebook experience, um, we did, we sat down and we were frustrated with their students. They had horrible notes. They were never referring back to them. We'd come, they'd come to tutorials and we'd say, where are your notes? Or look in your notes and they just weren't there. Um, so the time commitment up front is a little heavy. Uh, but we usually do it on the second day of class. The first day of class, we talk about using the notebook and what supplies they need. And then the second day of class, we actually set it up. And it does take about 20 minutes of your class time to set it up, which does sound like a lot, but it makes the rest of the semester so smooth. Um, so student feedback, I don't know if you guys can read that. It says easy to reference when studying, well organized to stay in single class. And I definitely plan on saving it. So that's always good if they save it for their next math class to refer back to. Um, some not so great feedback, so the reflections are a little tedious. We'll talk about those later. Requires diligent maintenance, which is true. Um, and not my style of note taking. So we don't force this on them. We just strongly encourage it. Um, we do make it as optional or as extra credit. We'll talk more about yeah, that. Yeah, we'll talk more about that. Um, instructor feedback, that's also really hard to read. Again, it's that time commitment up front. It can be a little tedious. The supply, organization, cutting and taping, and all of that can get a little bit much sometimes. Um, the structure that we have to have being prepared for class and having the notebook ready to go um, can sometimes be put a little extra pressure on you in addition to coming up with your lesson. But overall, it's been a very positive experience. So we're going to start off with um, your front cover. So if you have your sample notebook, that's where we're going to start. 
I have my students, I encourage my students, as you can see in the picture, to uh, write the name of the course as well as their name. Uh, I, I, this is my actual notebook, so I create one with them, with the students. So I have them, uh, so you can see my notebook saying the course, the semester, and the name of the class. So we're gonna name ours Mints, so we can see that here. So I am using that sample notebook and I am writing down Mints. Uh, and then you can do the same thing for yours. And remember what that stands for, so it's the Math Interactive, uh, notebook teaching strategies. So we're going to let the video catch up with us here. Um, I do want to make just a quick mention when the students are buying their notebook, um, I encourage them to get a notebook that's a full size sheet of paper in size, not a smaller one, not a little bit cheaper. Um, and I tell them to have at least 100 pages in their notebook. Uh, Sylvia is not quite as strict, but for me, I don't want them to run out of paper at the end. And my students put full-size sheets of paper into their notebooks, so I always have them bring a sheet of paper with them to the store and buy a notebook that will fit a full-size sheet of paper. So you have to kind of specify that so that they don't go buy the super cheap notebook and then run out of paper. And I have found that uh, for my um, college algebra and my trig and my pre-cal classes, I can squeeze by with 70 pages, um, but my calculus classes actually do notebook. So on the inside of our notebooks, I have the students put in um, the calendars. And so we're going to show you a cool way of doing that. So inside of your uh, sample notebook, you're on the inside cover, we're going to go on ahead and put in our calendars. So cut the calendars into two. What you want to do is find the one that has final exam. And you're going to take that only at the bottom. Uh, so you can see here that uh, is actually, oh, sorry, <laughs> she's saving it at the top, which is fine. Um, we're going to save that one at the top. She gets the other one and she tapes that one at the bottom. So notice one's going to be on top, taped at the top, and the other one's going to be taped at the bottom. And the whole purpose is that after the first eight weeks, you can flip the pages and then now you can. The students actually encourage that. Uh, they actually do that in their other classes. They've actually said that they actually like that. Yeah, and sometimes they'll record their grades on quizzes and tests or whatever other assessments you have. They'll write their grades down on their Google calendar. They also like to mark other things that are going on if they don't have their own personal planner. Um, and it, it's really nice because they'll tell you when they're going to be absent because they can actually see it on the calendar. So it's been very beneficial to have that right up front in their notebook. In my notebook, uh, when we'll take a test after the test, I will tell them what the average of the test was, and that's what I put in my notebook in the, under my calendar. And I encourage them to put their grade on there so that that way they can see the progress without having to go into uh, whatever the uh, reporting system for grades. They can just go ahead and look at their uh, notebook and see their grades up front. And they stop asking the question, when's the next test? Because <laughs> it's right there. And so we're also going to do, uh, I have my students on the inside, first page that you see in your notebook, I have them have a title page, so we're going to make sure we do that with ours as well. And it can include as much information as you want. I always tell my students to remember that if they leave their notebook behind, they may not know who they are, but they may know who I am as an instructor, and then they can put it in my box and I'm going to give it back to them. So we're going to do the same thing um, in our uh, handy handy notebook as well. I think I skipped it. Did we miss it? No, I think I, I went up ahead. But I, oh, okay. one, one last thing that I do want to mention, sorry. Uh, one last thing I do want to mention, and in that title page towards the bottom of it, I have them, and so does Christina, we have them write down a math buddy. It's the name of a student in the classroom and their contact information. Uh, Christina actually has them do a backup buddy. I actually put them in groups of small teams, and I tell them to write down the entire team uh, names and contact numbers so that that way, if they're running late, I tell them I'm not checking my email, but they'll say, oh, you know, so-and-so texted, they're running late. so. We, you know, keep the door open for them or whatever. Uh, yeah. or look at them. So good study buddy, if one or the other is absent, um, they can get the books from them. And they're hesitant at first, and I told them it might be a little funky the first week of class, but try to find someone that has a similar work schedule as you or similar whatever as you or that's close to you um, and connect with them. It's always good to have at least one in the transitional classes. It's always good to have two because people disappear in those classes. All right, so 
the title page we didn't fully detail, but I think you get the idea of that. If you turn the page, we always use the left and the right side of all the pages, which bothers some students and they won't use the backs, but it really makes the notebook very nice to have the left and the right. Um, left hand side pages are always odd numbered and right hand side pages are always even numbered. Uh, the left is usually a review and a reflect and we'll talk a little bit more about those throughout the PowerPoint and different examples of those. So the top half of the left would be a review. Um, and for this specific session, we're going to talk about why did I choose this session? So that might be a warm up question. When the students come into class, they'll have the review written down, take three to five minutes, whatever your time is, to think about and work out that review. And then the bottom half of the page is called a reflection. And so this is done at the end of class or after class, but we have learned the hard way to have them write it down at the beginning of class because you run out of time at the end. So we always have them write down the reflection question to be thinking about throughout that day's lesson. So on the bottom half of your page, if you could write down at what we call a three, two, one reflection, three things you learned today, two questions that you have, and one thing you enjoyed about the session. So that's specific to this session, but we'll talk about more generic review and reflects that you can use in your classroom. And then immediately on the right-hand side would be an even number to make sure you can start a new and that one of the things that I'm trying to institute um, this coming semester is to have my students do more uh, on their own and then in class actually discuss their reflections. Um, I think this is one of the, this is, and I tell the students that, that this is the interactive part. This is where they're actually writing down things for specific for themselves. So the same thing for you at the end of the seminar, you might want to uh, write down three things that you learned today or you know, a lot of seminars or webinars that you go to will sit there and say, how are you going to implement this? Right. So this is basically the same thing. And if you have any questions, there's a good place to write it down. So when you go to the next session or the next class or whatever the case may be, you can follow up and you know what your questions are. Uh, and then obviously I always put down one thing that they enjoy. Maybe um, on the first day of classes, I have them write down a name of a student in the classroom. So it kind of forces them to, to have a goal at the end. That's one thing I did like about having to reflect up front mm -hmm. is that they knew what to be looking for during the semester or during the class session. Yeah, what to listen for. And so we're going to put in our first uh, handout. So we have several different ways to put in handouts. This is just one way of doing it. So if you take your mitts handout that you cut in half um, and kind of fold it like a cut, well, that takes a little bit of getting used to, but it's not, not too hard to do. Um, and you can see in the video, you're going to tape it, you're going to open it up, tape it on the top and the bottom, and that way it will still close. And uh, we usually have things on the flaps that are blank right now. Um, you can see the picture next to the video as um, kind of our first day handout. It's like a miniature version of our syllabus. It's a little bit more brochure style with all the important information for the course. So we print it front and back, but we leave the back panel of the back blank. So they can tape it down flat, but it has a lot of information on it. We like to have it at the very beginning of the notebooks so that they can really see it. And we always copy on bright colored paper so they can find it. When are your office hours? What is your email? What do I do about this or that? It's nice to have it all right there. So well, that's always on page two. So when students ask, uh, when are your office right. hours? Page, page, page two. two. <laughs> What's your contact information? When do I email you? Page two. All that information is on there. They, I think they like it. So let's go to page three, which remember that's going to be on the left side, and we're going to do a reflect, uh, a review and reflect. So we're just going to do uh, examples of what kind of reviews and reflection you might want to do. So on page three, you might want to write down the word review and then write down um, some of the ideas that we have here. One of them is the contents from the previous day. Uh, I actually have used a skill that they need for this particular lesson. Um, but you can also ask a question about important reminders or due dates. Uh, I know Christina does that Transitional a lot. math, I do that a lot. What's coming up next week? When is your final exam? When is this due? Um, and just lots of very important questions for them to write down. What I like about, for example, uh, we might be doing, let's just get a topic of college algebra in your uh, trying to graph polynomials and you want to find the zeros of your polynomial. And I know that it's going to include a, a uh, got a cubic function, and so we'll talk about how to factor that. So the review might have the cubic function, 
and they have to just factor it completely. So that's a skill that they need. And then when we're doing the notes, I don't have to go over that again. And I even tell them in their notes, write down, uh, see review, so that they understand that we didn't skip that part, we already did that. And as another reflect, you already saw the three, two, one summary, where you say three things um, that you learned, two things that you have questions about, and one thing you enjoyed. I also have the one-two punch, which is one skill that I understood today, and maybe two skills that I need to work on. Or you could do it the opposite, right? One thing I understood, uh, uh, two things I understood, and then one thing that I need to work on. So that's just an idea of some sample we can reflect. Yeah, I think it's good in the reflect. Um, it's important to identify what their weaknesses are, what they need extra practice on, but I think it's always good to have them find something that they were already good at or they were already familiar with, something that was easy for them to understand, just to, especially in the transitional classes, kind of build their confidence and show them that this was not total gibberish, there was something that you understood. And having them write that down uh, really makes a difference. Same thing in my calculus classes, it's really nice for them to realize, oh, I did understand this part, uh, and that I do need to work on something else. So. Sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the next thing that we're doing, so I'm showing you the number three, uh, page three, where we wrote down the review and the reflect. The other thing that we do on page four is the table of contents. Uh, so I'm writing down uh, the table of contents. And this varies. You can write down, um, I do it by topic, and maybe I'll add some subtopics to it. Uh, notice I'm putting on a tab on there. That's uh, usually the beginning of the unit so that they can see that. Um, but the content can be as complex as you want it or as simple as you want it. Mine is usually just a topic and maybe a subtopic. Uh, I, have, I write that down with the students, but I have the students find the page numbers in their notebook that correspond to those topics. I know Christina adds the textbook section of it. We used to have the date on it. We realized that yeah, was, the date not. was not useful. <laughs> so uh, the textbook section is good. The title of... Um, uh, the same title that I use in the calendar, I put that on there, and then I do the subtopics. For example, going back to the graphing of the polynomial, students were like, well, where did we do synthetic division? So I put that as a subtopic. Yeah, so there you go. So this is Christina's example of section and topic page level. So after the table of contents, again, you'll turn the page. Um, so the left side would start a class. So anytime you start a new class or start a new lesson, you always turn the page. Um, and we'll talk about extra leftover pages in just a few minutes. But when you start a new lesson, uh, your left side would be review and reflect. And again, we've talked about a few of those. I think there's a handout on those that will um, that you can tape in there, or there's another spot. I think you can tape in there as well. Yes, we did. <laughs> so. So you'll start a new lesson on an odd-numbered page. Um, that little handout is a little bit more about review of the class. Uh, the website at the bottom is the website to create this foldable notebook, which students don't really need, but it's there for you if you like this little book that I did. Uh, but the one I did there is just tape it on one side and then fold it. You can actually have a two-sided handout and just tape it on one side, and then they can see both sides. Um, and it's not completely taped. And then your even page that goes with that review and reflect will be your new lesson for the day. Um, and that can be done several different ways. We'll talk about that as well. But the big thing that, uh, one of the things we wanted to show with this video was different ways of taking handouts that you've already made. So it's not like reinventing the wheel. So if there's already something that you really truly enjoy doing, I have the students uh, do it uh, before we take it in. So that way it's easier to write on them. Uh, but that way they can access both the funds and the documents. So new lessons or topics um, start on even pages. They always start on the right. And so you'll title the page. I always title it with the section number from the textbook, the description that matches the table of contents and matches the calendar and even matches the name of the homework that goes with it. Um, and then the page number, again, to align with the table of contents. And then you can just take your notes. You can tape in examples. Uh, you can tape in empty grids for graphing, handouts, whatever you have planned for the day. We've adapted into the notebook in lots of different ways. And so I think we have some more pictures somewhere uh, with just different ways that we've taped in word problems, grids, pre-printed notebook handouts, um, whatever that might be. 
So as the students are taking notes and they've run out of room on the first page, the initial even number page, when they turn the page, they don't continue numbering. After that is what we call an EX page for examples. Um, and so as soon as you're done with your initial even numbered page, you'll turn the page if the notes are continuing and you'll write an EX page on the left and they come in pairs. And so if the EX page is on the left, you automatically is able to write as an EX page. And students can use as many of these as they need. Some of my students write really, really big and they need a lot of EX pages. Other students write small and they hardly ever use EX pages. Um, but you always use EX pages for overflow, extra notes, extra handouts, grids, whatever the case might be. My students usually have at least one set of EX pages per section of notes. And then when that lesson is done, we all turn the page to a clean set of pages and number consistent. So everybody's numbered pages are the same or start the same, and our EX pages vary based on the lesson at the end of the day. For me, uh, what I do is the first uh, new day topic, so I have the review and reflect, and then I have uh, an even page of notes, and we turn the page together, and we still number those two pages um, because that's where those subtopics are going to be found. Uh, so I have that already planned into my notebook. However, I tell the students, you know, if you're writing big or you left a lot of space, or whatever the case may be, just go on ahead and go to the next page, call those EX pages, and that way our numbering will still be together as a class. However, they needed more room or more space, um, they can go ahead and add on to their notebook. The biggest thing that they have a hard time with is only, oh, well, I only need one page of EX. I don't know. They come in pairs. So if you do one EX, you actually have a batch of EX. To they don't them. like the blank page because they just have to take a deep breath and be okay with it. Um, but yeah, they do come in pairs so that the left and right on an even stay consistent. Uh, so yeah, these are just some examples. Sorry, go right. ahead. <laughs> okay. So these are some examples. Uh, you can see where we're putting in the grids. Uh, the other one that uh, Christina liked a lot, um, that's Christina writing, saying that you can write down space for work. Uh, for them to show the problem, show their work, as well as to graph. Uh, and if you look at the upper left corner, you can see some uh, of Christina's work in terms of graphing, as well as a handout that I have with that graph paper. Uh, what I'm showing you now in the video is actually how to get more pages for your buck kind of thing. So for this one, I'll probably write down the procedures on one side, and, at, and on that third of a page, uh, I'll write down example number one. So we do that together, going through the procedures, and I have them do example number two. Notice that example number two covers up the procedures, and then we do example number three. So they have both the procedures and a couple of examples, uh, actually three examples on one page. So if you're running out of pages or you feel like you're going to run out of pages, you can add that extra half page to and it, it keeps them engaged, uh, just the simple thing of cutting up a page into thirds and it's a different color than a normal size sheet of paper. Um, it really keeps them engaged and they're more willing to go through it. I'm not sure why, but it just works. Um, and I like having the procedure with all the examples that go with that procedure all on the page. So that's a really handy way to um, have everything together. Uh, that's it. Yeah, the graphing was really nice. I really, really liked having those little grids. Um, on the top right. Oh, right. And then on the top right, problems. if there's a word problem or something like that, I just go on ahead and cut that out and copy it and have them cut it out, um, especially if I have a whole set of them. Um, yeah, but pre-printed. The yeah. Pre-printed. And so that way all they have to do is cut them and tape them, and we're not spending time writing down the actual word problem. Uh, so that actually uh, is really time, time saving. Mm -hmm. Big time. And they stay more engaged. So I know someone's writing on a word problem, they're already disengaged much less even going through the procedure. Uh, so it's really nice to have them redone. Uh, so we're doing page, we should be on page nine of our little notebook. If not, don't panic. Yeah, we might be off. <laughs> uh, but we should be on an odd number page. So we moved over from the two EX pages and we should be on a do and reflect. Uh, again, um, here's some more ideas about what you can do for the review. You can probably ask a couple of questions from the last lesson's homework assignment. Um, this is really good in terms of uh, having students refresh whatever skill that they learned the day before so that that we use it today, um, it's fresh on their mind. Uh, the 
the other one. A weekend. <laughs> yeah. yeah um, the other thing I do is after we I give a test, I look for the most missed questions, uh, and then I put those as a review. So that way, that day after the test, we do two reviews: one for the review of the test, and then one um, for the the new lesson. Um, but that's a good place to have them write down the most missed questions. And I tell them that's how I get the extra credit questions, if you will, for the next half so that they know that. At the end of the semester, I actually have them write down the questions that they could do uh, so that way we can make our uh, final exam. So we do that a little bit differently. The other thing, too, is ask a question similar to the one that's on the upcoming quiz uh, so that way they are prepared for the quiz that you're going to give them right now. But more importantly, it's a review. Yeah. yeah. And another suggestion for the reflect is uh, how does uh, what we learned today relate to what we did uh, previously? So that's actually a really good question because that's going to have them make connections uh, in in the topics and how important it is to know one topic before we go on to the next. Yeah, compare and contrast this uh, skill to the previous skill. Like when we're learning factoring and quadratics and we learn lots of different ways to solve quadratics and talk about what are the different ways, what are some things you like about that way, what don't you like about that way. So that reflection is a good spot to do a lot of that. Comparing and contrasting that higher level thinking that we don't always have time to have discussions for in class, the reflections are a good place for that. And like I mentioned earlier, one of the things I want to do is make time for those reflections. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping to get the reviews done um, on their own and then come back uh, on the next day and, and actually discuss the reflect that they should have been doing. Wish yeah, me luck on that one. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. Wish me luck. Um, the other last thing that we should be towards the end of our, uh, our sample notebook, uh, we should have one more page. And what we're going to do, let me just explain that and then there's a video that hopefully that will make it a little bit clearer. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be folding that last blank page that is on the left. We're going to fold it and then we're going to move it over uh, and make a pocket with the back page. So I'm going to show you that in just a second. But um, what we do is by just making another sheet of paper, as you can see on the first picture on the left, I get a page, I fold it down, uh, and then I tape it on the three sides, or two sides, the bottom and the edge. Um, but we can use that for graded papers. I know Christina uses that for her classes. I have them use it for grids or if we're working on a handout that has a word problem so we didn't do all of them, I tell them to stick it in the back pocket, we'll pick up there tomorrow, um, and or whatever the case may be. But uh, we're going to make a, a sample pocket mm -hmm. in our notebook. So here we go. Let's see our video. The trick is hard the <laughs> so there we were on page nine doing our review and reflect. So notice that's the back cover. So I'm going to make sure we open up that back cover. This page right here um, is going to be our last page. So we're going to bring it down diagonally. I creased it there, and then I'm going to bring it over to the back cover. And then we're going to tape at the bottom and at the edge. And that creates a pocket. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> so Sylvia just does a pocket on the back cover of the notebook, and they just put everything in that same pocket as needed. I create a pocket find every table of contents. So when we start a new unit and we make our table of contents, the next thing they do is make a pocket. And I fold it the other direction and turn it backwards against the table of contents. And I usually do uh, paper quizzes for my face-to-face -face classes and paper tests. And when they get their quizzes back and their tests back, I have to put that in that pocket for that unit, along with extra handouts, grids, whatever, else we need to put in that pocket. Um, but they keep their graded papers behind each table of content for each unit. Uh, Sylvia doesn't do that because she doesn't let them keep their tests. <laughs> and she has online quizzes. So it's just, if you're going to have a lot of handouts in class, those pockets behind every table of content are very handy. Uh, we also made what we call a mini pocket. And I'll have some more pictures of that here in a second. You can use an index card for this, or just a scrap of square paper. A post-it might work as well, depending on what as you need. Um, I don't know you've had that supply, I just wanted to show you. Uh, for that pocket, you tape it on three sides but not the top, and then you can tuck smaller things in there. So you can tuck grids in there. Um, I use index cards. So if you put one index card, landscape, 
then you can tuck other index cards in. Um, so flashcards, the quadratic formula, the forms of linear equations, quadratics, whatever um, topic you have, you can tuck those cards in there as kind of flashcard pockets. As they reflect sometimes when we do the exponential rules, um, what I'll have them do is create a pocket uh, for the reflect, and their job is to create flashcards, and those flashcards need to go into that pocket. I give them a sheet of paper, we fold it up to whatever size you want, and I have them make flashcards that will fit into that pocket. Uh, and that's part of the reflect. Yeah, and you do that as well for like formulas specific to them that they need to focus on. I've done that before yeah, too. Yeah, like what are the three that you're worried about remembering, and you just make a couple flashcards for them. So that's I think that's it about the pockets. Um, and then at the end, and this is optional. This is something that we created because uh, we wanted the notebooks to stand out for them and we wanted to strongly encourage them without forcing them. Uh, so we make it extra credit at the end of the semester. Uh, we take up the notebook the day of the final exam and we grade them very quickly, um, just kind of spot checking throughout the notebook that they've kept up with it. Um, and you have an example of Sylvia's rubric and my rubric. My rubric has changed a little bit. I used to try to check every single page, but that's just unreasonable. So I do kind of spot check more like Sylvia, but you're just, you're checking that the reviews have been completed, that the reflects have been completed. You might want to put some extra weight on those reflects. They get a little lazy about those. That the notes are structured correctly and complete. Um, and that they have it pretty much lined up the way they need to. It should be relatively easy if they've kept up with it throughout the semester. Nearly impossible if they have not. Um, but I just grade it and they tuck their rubric in that back pocket um, and I give them back their notebooks and so they keep their notebook and I keep the rubric. So the rubric, what we do is up to 20 points, which sounds like a lot, but it's not overly inflate their grade by too much. Uh, 20 points on their lowest test grade, not including the final exam grade. So that's what we decided was significant enough to stand out without being just overly generous. So those 20 points affect their grade by about maybe two to three percent, maybe not even that at the end of the semester. Uh, but 20 is just such a big number to them and it really helps them uh, stay motivated up with that notebook and they know if they have a scary test grade that that 20 points can actually make it a little less uh, painful. So we found that rubric really helpful and it keeps them motivated throughout the semester. Yeah and I post my rubric um, shortly after the first class so when we're making the notebook, I right, tell them that, that the rubric is already online so that they can see what is expected of them. I told them that um, I, I want this extra credit to be something they couldn't do overnight, um, but I also wanted them to be complete. And so uh, those 20 points seems like a lot, but we also don't drop any lowest right. test grades. The lowest test grades are something. Um, and, and I also, hardly get all 20 points. <laughs> that's true. Um, but the other thing I do is I also give it a top limit. I will give you the 20 points, but it's a grade to not exceed over 100. So it's still you can get that extra credit, but not uh, you know 120 points. That's right. not going to happen. If their lowest test grades are 90, they already have an A, so they really don't need the points, but they still do it anyway. Right. Um, um, but I also, when I tell them, especially after the first test, and I think most of us will probably agree that that first test is not necessarily the best, their best work. Uh, and so they kind of panic, but when I remind them that, you know, just add 20 points to it right now, yeah. and it's not a bad deal. So we, we realize that um, we can't use those 20 points for every test. It's only one test. Um, but I think they really enjoy that at the end they, they made a good product uh, and that it is complete. So um, we can see that on the rubric where we give them points um, for structure, and then uh, the vast majority of my points, of five points are for structure. And 15 or 15. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's what we want to get to. I think that's all we have. We can't see the question and answers, so if there's a whole ton of them, we can definitely answer those questions. We were just trying to be mindful of our time and because we can talk more about all the little details that we experience. Right, right. So we do have a couple questions that um, have come in. One of them is what about students who are absent? How do they get get the notebook caught up. Okay. Um, I, can, I can take that one because my students are absent a lot teaching the transitional classes uh, in, the, in the Houston area. Um, 
So usually the first time they're absent, they want your notebook and I do not give them my notebook. Um, I say, do you remember the study buddy I told you to get at the beginning of the semester, get with them and get their notes. Um, and I've noticed recently a lot of them take pictures of the other students' notebook and then just blindly copy it. And I'm gonna have to start discouraging that and encouraging them to go meet somewhere, you know, meet in the, in the college, meet somewhere and actually have student A who has the note explain them to you as you write them down. Because uh, just blindly copying them does not do them any good. So I've, they've gotten a little lazy about just taking pictures with their phone. But they will, at least transitional students will come to you at first and you have to encourage them to, because my notes are not complete. I don't show all my work in my notebook, which is my skeleton of what I'm gonna teach for the day, and then I work on the board. So I don't have everything filled in, and they need to uh, use their study buddies, use their classmates with those notes. I actually, and they're more motivated, especially yeah. with the notebook, to go ahead right. and get those notes. Because they know that their notes are supposed to look like their buddies anyway, so they're more willing to go ahead and go know that the notes that their buddy is taking are complete because mm -hmm. that's exactly what we told them to do in the classroom. So, um, so that's, that's, and I tell them that, you know, if you were absent, this is what page we're on, so you number your pages. Yeah, your, skip a few. Skip yeah. your pages that you need, and then this is where we're starting, and that's where we get started, and you can talk to your buddy about those missing pages. Mm -hmm. Okay. Another question came in. It said, interactive notebooks are used quite a bit in our K-12 schools, mainly at junior high and lower, uh, lower grades. How do post-secondary students really feel about this project? For the vast majority of them, the answer is thank God, because at least <laughs> they, they know where things, they know what to write down, where to write it down. It's very structured. Um, I've had one student, two students maybe in the last six semesters that have said, you know, that's not for me. Mm -hmm. And that's fine because it's extra credit, so it's not going to hurt them academically. Um, however, uh, a lot of them, like I said, has been a positive uh, feedback that we've gotten from the students. Um, one thing that I have noticed is before the test, uh, they're in the hallway, they're looking, each of them are looking at their own notebooks or they're comparing notebooks and making sure that what they wrote down is correct. And so it's, it's really nice to see that they are using it. So uh, I think the post high school, I think they're, they're more uh, appreciative of it. I think they realize the usefulness of it. Uh, whereas I think that beforehand when they were in, in K through 12, it was more one more thing they have to and because this is optional, I think um, they really like that. Yeah, and I'll say, I mean, we both taught high school. So and I taught high school uh, prior to coming to the college level. And I taught high school most recently. And they do all those wonderful notebooks um, in middle school and elementary school. And then they get to high school and they're gone. I mean, when I, the most recent in my high school experience was all the notes were pre-typed in little handouts. And they just had to fill them out or maybe not even fill them out. And they didn't have to physically take notes. Um, and even at the middle school and elementary school level, it might have been a bunch of handouts where they didn't have to physically write notes. And so having this structure is something that they might have never experienced before, or they went through their high school years and the few years between high school and community college where they did not have the structure. And so it's been mostly appreciative. I will say the first day we set it up, I do see some eye rolls, like this is ridiculous. On elementary school, why are we using markers and scissors and scissors and tape? And this is silly. Uh, but then, and even the female and male students, I have mostly female students, but even the male students, are like, oh, this is so helpful when I go into my homework online at home. I can open my notebook and see the examples and actually read my own handwriting and find them. Uh, but there is some hesitation and some eye rolling at first, especially with the older students. Uh, but they do, they mostly catch on. I've had very few that just straight up refuse. Um, and that's usually fresh out of high school because they're trying to be cool, I guess, um, and just not do what everyone else is doing. But otherwise, they're all on board. But I think one of the things that we've noticed about students and what they do like about what they get um, from just our style of teaching is you know the handouts if you ask them what they like they like the handouts what they didn't realize is i created those handouts so i can move faster in my life <laughs> and do more examples. and do more yeah. examples and so that's the reason why i type out the word problem 
that way we can move faster. Uh, and so the notebook actually just puts it in a place that's more legible and where they can find it. So that you'll see little strips of pieces of colorful pieces of paper on their notes, and that's where the word problem is, and underneath is where the word is shown. So they, um, so I, like I said, I think they realize that it's it's the structure that they were lacking or were never taught that. Uh, yeah. So they they take these skills into the next classroom. So I think maybe note taking is something we end up at the college level as soon as we have, and we realize that they don't. Yeah, even at the classes, it's, it's amazing how little structure, how disorganized they are. All right, another, another question just came in, and it is, are your students also using a traditional textbook? Yes and no. Yeah. Um, we, I'm pretty sure a lot of people have the online. We use my math lab, and so the book is in there. One of the things that um, one of my students in calculus said, you know, you spent a lot of time writing down definitions. Why don't you just give that to us? I'm like, oh, yeah, right, no. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to create those reviews ahead of time, as well as a list of definitions that they can do in their book or online or whatever they need to do in order to come up with those, you know, like the formulas that they're all going to be the same regardless of what they do. Definitions are going to be the same whether you Google it or whether you look in the math book. So I want them to be able to do that on their own. And then that way in class, we spend more time on uh, explaining more about what that definition means as opposed to writing it down, spending quality time writing it down. So um, one of the things that, that's my goal for this next semester is to have them pre-written and then they can either print them out or I take a copy of them and they can know before they walk in the next class period what these definitions are. Uh, and so that way I'm making them use that book um, because everything for us is online as opposed to an actual paper book. I think they lose sight that they actually have a yeah. book. Yeah. So I'm hoping that with those reviews and those definitions, they're going to have to be that traditional book, uh, whether it's in a paper format or online. Yeah, I, I, in my college algebra class especially, I do them in transitional classes, but not quite as much. But in my college algebra class and in statistics as well, during our note taking, I'll say, if you want another explanation of this, or if you want to see another way to do this, or another example of this, go to page blah, blah, blah in the notebook and the textbook. Because our textbooks are digital, they can just type in the search bar whatever the page number is and pull it up exactly. And so a lot of the, I'll capture things out of the, out of the book and they're trying to write it down. I'm like, you don't need to write this down. It's in your book on this page. And so I encourage them to use their digital textbook, use the shortcut, just type in this page number and you can see more explanation. You can see another way to do it. You can see an extra example. And so I do encourage them, especially in college algebra, I give them page reference numbers throughout the notes, throughout the examples, um, so that they can use that book. I don't know if they actually use it, but hopefully at least a few of them do. Okay. We do have another question that came in, and, it, and the question is, do you use a, and it, this is in quotes, do you use a traditional lecture format for your classes? And if so, can you see this notebook working as well in classes where the lecture format is not the norm? I think, I think we do do the traditional lecture format. Um, and I do see it working for the non-traditional format. And I say that because I am trying to go to a little bit more exploratory um, uh, teaching style. Um, I think it will work. I think the problem is going to be still that structure. There's some things that we make sure that we want them to know. And I think that's just me trying to hold on to my lecture. Yeah. <laughs> and I've flipped a classroom. So with the flipped classroom, when they're watching or taking notes outside of the class, I've made videos. And so what I've done is instead of having them handwrite everything, I type out what I call guided notes with kind of fill in the blank. Here's the examples we're going to work out. And it's kind of spaced out for them. And so as they follow along with the video that I've made, they fill in those guided notes. And so instead of a spiral notebook, they use a binder. Um, and so I've done that in my first classroom or my statistics classroom. There's way too many notes to write down and way too many handouts that I'd have to make. So I actually have a whole packet with the entire chapter and I just call it guided notes. 
And as we go through class, um, so that class is a little bit more interactive. We do some more activities, some more hands-on discovery type of things. And so I have all of that pre-typed for them. Um, and they use a binder instead of a spiral. So I think in a non-traditional, if you're doing more hands-on, more activities, more discoveries, um, maybe a binder would be more appropriate if you have kind of pre-printed handouts for them, either follow along in class or at home. So that, that was one way I've switched it for statistics is kind of like that. The other thing too that I've done that I found very useful using the notebook is days that I have to be gone for whatever reason, I can create a video with those page numbers and the page numbers to follow along the pages from there. Uh, so it's not, it's still a traditional lecture style and they're looking at the video, but they can see me working out the video, uh, the examples and stuff. Uh, sometimes I'll go on ahead and just scan my notes. And so it's the question of what to write down and where to write it down, it's, that's answered. However, you know, the whole point of it is that the, the examples they wanted to see done, they can see that in the so we've done that. But I do agree with Christina that depending on what you want to do in the classroom, mm -hmm. the notebook is flexible enough. I think the biggest thing we need to make sure we remember is that you and reflect, that is the heart of the interactive part. And so we still, that can still exist. Yeah, and Julie, you use it differently. I don't know if you're allowed to jump in with what you do. I know you use it a little differently in your classroom. I, I do. Um, so I uh, got an opportunity to meet Christina and um, Sylvia in Denver. And so I kind of wrestled with this because I do most of my introductory content ahead of class uh, with, with video, et cetera. And so I document what I do in class. So like the activities, I love the review and the reflect piece. I, I do that as well. But in class, you know, when you're practicing those harder examples, um, et cetera, I like to document that now. So what I was finding with my flipped classes is that it was hard to, you know, like they do all this good stuff, but nobody wrote anything down. And yeah. so it was, this really gives people, uh, oh yeah, this is what we did. This is important. And we did this activity and then here's, here's what I think and uh, what I think I need to work on out of it and what was good and what I knew and all that kind of stuff. So this has helped my class tremendously. Yeah. Is there anything else? Um, I think our Q&A is empty at the moment. Um, anything else from so you? I know. <laughs> I know. So nothing else that they missed? I know that their videos were awesome uh, to show us what they were doing. Um, along the way so that we could follow along and I followed along just fine although it was a little anticipatory I, uh, I kind of knew what you were going to do oh, right. obviously. Yeah. so for me it might, might not be a good test um, uh, you, one just came in exactly and Kathy uh, said just said, wanted to say um, I wanted to say thank you I use this method as a student and I can't believe I didn't think of of it until oh. till right now, which I yeah. was always jealous of the middle schools. I taught in high school, and so the middle yeah. schools would do all this fun interactive notebook, and the history class would do it, and all these other classes. And I was like, well, that won't work for math. And Sylvia was the same way. And so a few semesters we were ago, we were like, we're going to make this work for math. And so we took everything we could find, and just made it work um, for transitional, and then credit level as well. I mean, just. We made it work for, for college level math. It was just driving us crazy that all these cool things were out there and we could not seem to make it work for math. Right, I think right. The thing that sold a lot of people uh, on doing the net interactive notebook when we were in Denver is when I said at the end of the year, when you're sitting there and you have to collect all the things and activities and handouts that you use for the semester. It's done. Yeah. Because if you if you do <laughs> the notebooks a lot of Yeah, uh, if you do the notebooks yes, as yeah. you go along with the students, then all the activities are documented. Everything all the handouts are documented. So I yeah. really use the, the latest one and I just use that as a reference for the next one. Right. A couple more comments have come in. Um the, the one that was asking about, you know, I've used this as a student, um, what she said was, I was told ahead of time by an older student to get wire bound index cards for like all your calc formulas. And yeah. she still has that. So it's, it's kind of the same idea, um, you know, obviously scaled down, but to keep track of those things. Mm -hmm. another, an, yeah, another comment, it was great. And, and this person has things to think about for implementation, uh, which is awesome. So you're obviously inspiring us. Yeah, we um, have science teachers, we've had yeah. other um, course subjects, yeah. so 
trying to adapt it and it's not quite working, always email us and we can get in touch with other instructors that have used it a little bit differently. Okay. Um, and, and just see how it works. Great. Great. Super. So I want to thank you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and switch over if there's no other questions. Maybe I should right. wait. The only thing I was going to yep. make sure we listed was um, on page one of your sample notebook. Yep. For the reflect, remember we said, why did you choose this to review? But for the reflect, it was three things that you learned today, yeah. two questions you still might have, and then one thing you enjoyed about this session. So I just want to remind you that now that we're at the end, yeah, just, like, it down. <laughs> just like we would do in our classroom, when I finish a little early in my classrooms, I tell them go back to that reflect. Let's see if we can answer those now before we leave. So that way, we already have something written down for us and our experience. Sure. I just wanted to make sure we mentioned that. I don't know if you're sharing my screen or not, but oh yeah, you're st you're still there. I mean, I'm that's still on there. Okay, yeah, yeah, so that, that's with, great but, too. Um, but yeah, yeah. But my whole point is, is uh, you know, three things that you learned today, two questions you might still have, and uh, obviously one thing that you enjoyed. So uh, I do thank everybody for the comments. As well. Yeah, thank you uh, very much. I'm going to go ahead and switch back over. If you want to leave uh, messages for uh, Sylvia and Christina in the chat, you certainly can uh, do that. I'm going to go ahead and share back to my PowerPoint. And yeah, it's like acting wonky for me today. There we go see if I can get back. <laughs> I want to thank you for participating in today's webinar. If you'd like um, to support future AMATIC webinars, please consider becoming a member of AMATIC. And you can do that by going to bit.ly slash join dash AMATIC. We are on social media. Some of you might have heard about the webinar on social media. Uh, we are on Facebook. We're also on Twitter. Check us out. The um, Vice Presidents also made Facebook pages for each region, so you might want to check that out as well. Uh, recordings of past AMATIC webinars can be found at bit.ly slash AMATIC dash webinars. And actually, this, when this webinar ends today, you'll be um, pushed to that page so you know exactly where it is. It usually takes me about one to two weeks to produce and upload, um, archive, you know, take care of the, the webinar to get it um, uploaded to our website and then I will certainly let you know. If you could please take a few minutes to evaluate the webinar and the content and the, and the webinar content with the presenter, um, please go to bit.ly slash amatic61. In just a moment, I'll go ahead and put that hyperlink in the, uh, in the, in the chat box. Um, but be sure to do this if you need email confirmation of your participation in this webinar to get one of those certificates uh, that we do. Please make sure that you fill out that optional section, include your name and your email address again, because this isn't connected to the registration. So we need that information from you again. And let's see if I can figure out how emails to oh your emails um i did copy um you guys at carbon copied with the um the instructions that i sent out so they probably do have them but i can push those out again as well okay just in case a question pops up later or you're in the middle of implementation and stuff um, you can just an email right let me see i'm going to go ahead and stop the recording at this point